welcome to Church on the Move. It is so good to see you here today. As we start worship, we're going to start by reading God's Word. And the reason we do this each and every week is because it is good for us to be reminded of what the Lord has done. It's good for us to be reminded as to why we're here, which is to worship and glorify God. And so I brought a couple verses out of Psalm 103. They're going to be up on the screens. I want you to say these verses with me today. It says this in verse 1, to bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who heaps, forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Bless the Lord in all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. As we start today, can we take just a minute to lift our voices, to clap our hands and thank the Lord for what he has done. Lord, we love you. We honor you today. Be lifted high. We bless your name in this place. Let's sing this chorus all together today. Sing bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. Come on, lift it up in this place today. Sing bless the Lord.
heart, sing as loud as you can.
Welcome to church, everybody. Good morning. So good to see you this morning. I was just reminded as I was sitting over there in worship just how special it is that we get to do this every single weekend. You know, it's good to worship on your own, but it's even far better to worship in community. And to be honest, we met, we make each other sound a lot better than we do on our own, I think. Yeah, I'm just glad I can't hear myself. Absolutely. Well, if you're new to Church on the Move, my name is Priscilla. I'm up here with Chris. We serve as a couple of your pastors at Tulsa. And we take just a few minutes like this every single weekend to let you know a little bit more about what's going on in the life of the church. And honestly, to invite you to be a part of what's happening yeah. here. This weekend, we're closing out our series on the book of Ruth, and we have our very own next-gen pastor, Pastor Greg Scott, with us to bring the word. We've heard his message a couple of times. It's powerful, it's practical, and I've been telling everybody there's 0% chance you're gonna fall asleep in this service, so we're glad you're here. Man, you make promises that we can't keep. Yeah, they might fall asleep, but hey, it's gonna be a great week. We're closing out the Book of Ruth this week. We're starting a new series next week. We'll tell you more about it in just a second. But before we continue, I just wanna stop and say welcome. Maybe you're watching online this weekend. However you're joining us, thank you for hanging out with us. Those of you in the room, maybe this is your first time here. Uh, man, we're so glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us. We wanna send you a gift card just to say thank you for spending your weekend with us. In order to get that, you need to text NEW to 23101. We're gonna send you a gift card to Chick-fil-A again, just to say thank you from this family for being here this weekend. And then we're going to give you a next step. 
There's a next step that you can take to become part of this family. That's the way the Apostle Paul talks about the church in all of the New Testament is that we are a family, we're a body, and we believe that you have a part to play in that family and in that body. And so one of the ways to get connected to that is by texting NEXT to 23101. That's gonna connect you to a gathering we have every single month called Next Move. Our next round of Next Move is happening at the end of the month of June, right after this service, June 30th. You can stick around after the 1030. Priscilla, myself, Pastor Lee, and several other of our team will be there to just be able to connect you to the mission and vision here at Church on the Move. We invite you, come be a part. We would. If you've been putting it off, now's your time to do that. We hope to see you there. But we don't want to skip past what's happening next weekend. It's Father's Day weekend, and we have a lot of special and fun things planned for fathers and for families. But we're also, like Chris mentioned, we're kicking off a new series next weekend. It's called Major Lessons from Minor Prophets. And if you didn't grab one of these on the way in, make sure you do as you leave. This will tell you a little bit more about what to expect during that series. But we're gonna be walking through nine of the 12 books on the Minor Prophets that are kind of tucked away towards the end of the Old Testament. And I'm not gonna call any of us out about this, but if you're one that kind of skims through those books, on your Bible reading plan. This is gonna be a great time to get caught up. And next weekend, it's a great opportunity to invite someone to come with you. I know I'm gonna learn a lot during the series. We hope to see you. Can I steal this for a second? I wanna point something out. So next week, we're kicking off with the book of Jonah. That is actually one of my favorite books in all the Bible. So we'd be here. Pastor Witt will start that next week. But circle the date right in the middle of this, which is the July 14th date. So if you occasionally attend Saturday night services on July 13th, we will not have them because July 13th, 13th is love day. We pick this date right in the middle of the summer just because we all really want to suffer in the heat for Jesus together. So it's going to be really, really warm, but man, there is a greater reward for those of us that do. So we want to go ahead and encourage you to start looking for ways that you can participate in Love Day. We'll be sharing with you all of the different initiatives that we have in the coming weeks. And you can find these at cotm.info, our website, churchonthemove.com. But just want to put this on your radar. Love Day is that one day a year where it's an all skate. We're all going to get involved. We're all going to go out and help serve the community of Tulsa because the community should be better because we're here, church. And this is a day that we all get to demonstrate that and put that into practice together. So really looking forward to that. Another way that you and I put our faith into practice around here uh, regularly is by ways in which we give. We believe that as a form of honor, we give the first 10% back to God. We think that we can basically trust him more to do with, do with 90% in our life than we can do with 100. And so we give that first 10 back to God and say, hey, Lord, we trust you, we honor you, we put you first by way of our finances. But a couple of ways you can give up above and beyond is through what we call our compassion offering and also our expansion offering. Our compassion offering goes to fund all of our different partners here in the city of Tulsa from an outreach perspective and provide a, a little bit of help for things like Love Day. Also be able to meet needs in times of crisis like what we've seen with the tornadoes in Sulphur and Barnstall and Claremore and in Pryor. You can give to that by texting CO to 23101. And as always, you can continue to support our expansion offering by texting EXP. That is going into investment here in this building. We're in a campaign to improve the facilities here at COTM Tulsa, and we'll be sharing more about that in the coming weeks. But you can support that again by texting EXP to 23101. That's right. Well, we're excited to hear from Pastor Greg, but before we do, let's take a moment to pray together. Heavenly Father, we just slow down right now to commit this time to you, Lord. We open up our hearts to receive to you, and as we give you our time and our resource, we just ask you to bless those things and multiply those. We give you all of ourselves, Lord, and we're thankful that you're here with us now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good morning. I'm not going to go to sleep if you won't go to sleep. It's good morning. Good to see you guys this morning. Hey, we want to take a moment to just welcome a group of people that we serve um, in our correctional facilities in Oklahoma from uh, Dick Connor and Dr. Eddie Warrior. We want you to know we love you. Could you give these guys and ladies a big welcome to our church service today? We love you. Thank you for being a part of what we're doing. Hey, listen, we are in the final book of Ruth today, and uh, we are going to get this girl married and redeemed today. Now, they don't always go together. Those two don't always go together, but we're going to talk about that today and have some fun. Uh, if you would, get your Bible. We're going to read from uh, the whole chapter this morning. And if you haven't been here as part of our series, go back and read the first three chapters. It's so good, and, and it's such a practical story. And we fit into this story more than we think we do, but we're going to read today uh, the entire chapter. 
I'm going to read it and follow along. It'll be on the screen. If you have your Bible, you can follow in your Bible. I'm reading from the NIV today, and so let's read together. <clears throat> it said, Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate. He sat down there just as the guardian redeemer he had mentioned came along. Boaz came over. He said, Boaz said, come over here, my friend, sit down. So he went over and he sat down. Now, this is the guy that was responsible in Elimelech's family to, he was the next in line to redeem the family. It was his obligation to do it. He was part of a family and he was the next one to do it. That's why Boaz went to him and said, hey, I need to have a conversation with you. And it was a very public thing. It was basically on the town square. He said, hey, I need to have a conversation with you about this. And this is the conversation that he had. It says, Boaz took 10 of the elders of the town and he said, sit here. And they did so. Then he said to the guardian redeemer, Naomi has come back from Moab. She is selling the piece of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. I thought I should bring this matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of these seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me so I will know. For no one has the right to do it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, on the day that you buy the land from Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the dead man's widow, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this time, the guardian redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in the early times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property to be, become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the guardian redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. And Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilion, Malon. I also acquired Ruth the Moabite, uh, Malon's wife, as a widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property so that his name will not disappear from among his family and from his hometown. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all the people at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built the family of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like uh, that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord engaged and enabled her to uh, conceive. She gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of uh, Benadab. These are all great family names for you if you want to name your children something. Benadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to just open our hearts today. Everything that's going on or gone on this morning and what we're dealing with in our minds and our thoughts, we just ask you to help calm us so we can hear from you. Lord, I ask you to help, to help us, help me speak with clarity. Holy Spirit, we invite you again to speak to our hearts through this message, Lord, myself included. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we want to talk to you today about the word redemption. It is the whole storyline of the Bible, but it is very profound in this book. The whole idea of this chapter is about a redeemer has come. She finally meets him, redeems her, and gives birth to what we are in the line of, all the line of Christ. It's a big, big deal. So I have three points I'm going to get to you today. I'm a youth pastor at heart, so it's going to be really, really fast and hopefully a little fun. And if not, tell the teenagers. <clears throat> Listen, here's the first thing. Redemption is a journey. Do, wouldn't we love for redemption to just be one-time event and we don't have to deal with it anymore? 
It would be the greatest thing that if God was just like a microwave. We just turn it on for 10 seconds and everything that's supposed to come out right now comes out and we're good. It is also probably the most unhealthy thing you could ever have happen in your life on a regular basis. You have to be careful that you don't enjoy journeys. I just went on a trip with 60 teenagers to Disney World. Yeah. Yeah. When you're there and you're participating in the journey, it's, it's exhausting. I have pictures to prove all of this. It's, everybody asks me, do you love that? N- no. <laughs> I love teenagers. But that old journey being in Orlando for six days, we were in a park at Magic Kingdom. I got to the bus stop with all 60 teenagers at 6 a.m. and I left that park at 11 p.m. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a journey. You don't really enjoy it until you're done with it and you look back and you look at the pictures that you took. You know why? Because redemption is a journey. And most of the time when you're following God, you don't see his hand until you've already lived some of it. And you get to look back and go, oh, there was God. There was God. There was God. This is the point. We obey God's voice to move forward, but we see God's hand by looking back. We need to enjoy a journey. May the, oh no, March the 10th, 1989, I married the love of my life, my wife. And we started a family and we lived in Kentucky. And about a year into our marriage, I felt like the Lord was impressed on my heart that I knew what we were supposed to move to Tulsa, go to Bible college here. And so I approached Polly. I said, hey, sweetheart, this is what I feel like the Lord wants me to do. She looked at me and she said, that's just not going to happen. I went, okay, great. You know, when you marry the right person and they're married godly, they're like the fourth person of the Trinity. So it's like, you know, okay, whatever you say, that's exactly what we're going to do. So I, she, she, we were way too attached to our parents, and there's nothing wrong with that. We still love our, our parents are awesome. All, both my parents are alive. Her parents are alive. They all live within 30 minutes of each other in Kentucky. And we, she didn't want to leave. She'd only been married a year, and she didn't want to leave her family. And so about a year or so later, she came to me and she said, hey, uh, you still think this is a good idea, this whole Tulsa Bible College thing? And I went, no, no, it's a terrible idea. I love what we're doing. We were youth pastors. God was doing what he was doing and I just didn't want to go. No, nope, not going to do it. Well, in 1994, we gave birth to our first son, Ethan. And then two years later, in 96, we gave birth to Abigail. Well, Polly did. She lets me know, you didn't give birth to anything. I did. She did. <laughs> and so we had two kids at that time. We have three now, but we had two. And I brought it up again to her. I said, hey, what about this? You think we ought to do this? And we finally got an agreement that this is, was the plan of God for our life. It took us 10 years to decide that. Now, either I'm really, really slow, or God knew it was going to take 10 years, and he started in 1989 trying to get me to do the plan of God in 1999. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just like you are so slow that I'm, God knows that I am slow and ignorant, and I'm going to start really early with this dude, and that's how it is. But I'm going to just say this to you. When you're following God, you always want to be behind him. You want to make sure he's already been where you are going. You never want to be in front of him. That means you have to supply everything when you get ahead of him. It was such a great move for us to wait that long. Because here's what you have to understand with God. God will totally put you in an oven. He rarely makes anything great in a microwave. And he will bake you and slow things down for you so that you grow and mature in the process, in the journey. Most people that eat microwave food are large. They get large over time, I know. (laughs) One of the best things I ever learned is from Abraham where this happened in, we read this in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place, he would later, later, receive as his inheritance. He obeyed and went even though he did not know. know. 
Most of the people in the Bible, we read about it now, but it's in hindsight. They lived it without seeing the future. And if you're ever going to follow God and you're ever going to have a redemptive life, the one that Ruth had, you're going to have to follow God when you don't know. All you have is a leading and an impression. Well, we got to Tulsa. We moved to Tulsa. Paul and I moved to Tulsa. We uh, went to Bible school, and it was a two-year school. And so the first year, they wanted, they wanted you to go to the church to where the school was. So we obliged and said, we'll do this. And I, I, we were hesitant about it because we love Church on the Move. And we felt like, okay, you know, we love this place. We've been here before, and we had come to conferences and things like that. And, but I was going to do the right thing and <clears throat> obey and serve there. And so I knew I was supposed to serve, so I got an application, a volunteer application. I filled the application out. I was going to be an usher. And we call them auditorium hosts here, but <clears throat> pardon me. So I filled the application out, and I filled the whole thing out, and I was going up to the guest service counter at the church, and I was going to turn it in, and no one was there. There wasn't a single person at this guest services place. And I got there. Anybody ever just walk towards something you thought God wanted you to do? When you get close to it, you just start going, something's wrong with this. On the inside, you just start going, no. You get scratchy and just, ooh. Well, I got there, and I was so frustrated nobody was there, I tore the thing up and threw it in the trash. Right? By their guest services thing. Went home. Three or four four months later, I did it again because I felt bad. And I thought, you know what? I need to be serving and they want me to. So I filled the whole entire thing out again. Filling it out. And while I'm filling it out, I have this just this nagging feeling that I'm disobeying God. You know, you can do a good thing and be totally out of the will of God. And so I get ready to go turn it in, and the closer I get to turning it in, the worse I feel. And this is the only, uh, maybe one other time where I have felt like, hey, you are completely disobeying me by doing this. That's what I felt. So I went home. I took the application back home and tore it up at my house and threw it in the trash. Never filled another one out. Never volunteered a moment there. Well, the summer of 2000, we decided to come to church here, bring our kids here. Well, if you know anything about your kids and you get them around good kids in ministry, they're not leaving. We're not going back to some other church. We're staying right here. So we decided to stay here. There's people that didn't like it. They thought we should be there, and we understood all that. But you know what? I said, no, this is the will of God for my life. So I filled out. We went through the membership process at Church on the Move. This was in 2000, fall of 2000. Fill out the application, went through membership, filled out an application to volunteer as an usher. I volunteered here at Church on the Move as an usher from 2000 to 2001 at the 9 a.m. service every week, not knowing this was going to happen. You obey God, and you obey God's voice to move forward. You see the hand of God when you move back. You start seeing why, why I could not fill that application out and turn it in. I wasn't supposed to usher there. I was supposed to do the exact same job in the right place. And you see the hand of God by looking back and going, there it was, there it was, there it was. It has made it so much easier for me to follow the plan of God in my life now because I'm able to look back and go, I didn't blow it right there. That was God, and I knew it was. Does that make sense? It's just in the ordinary, natural steps that you and I take in life that the plan of God unfolds. And many of the times, we miss the whole thing. How many of you, everybody here generally remembers the story of David and Goliath? Probably the most famous story in the Old Testament, probably the most preached story in the history of the Old Testament. But what most people do not preach is the fact that David got up that day not knowing he was going to kill Goliath. He didn't even have it in his daytimer. He didn't write it out as one of his, this is, this is, this is on my uh, to-do list today. He didn't have it planned like that because God never, ever plans your life like that. Now, I'm not against to-do lists. I have them. But you know what David did that morning? He got up just like he normally does. He goes and takes care of a bunch of little sheep because that's what his dad wants him to do. Now, you have to understand, David has a little bit of a conflict with his bros because he's anointed king. 
and they didn't get picked, and they know it. As a matter of fact, you know there's conflict because when David got to the, where Goliath was, his brother had something to say to him about it. But here's the thing. He's just minding his own business, doing something that's totally natural, taking care of sheep. That's his responsibility. That's his job. And then his dad decides to make him a DoorDash driver. I'm going to DoorDash. I need you to take lunch to your brother's. So he is employed at DoorDash and just takes the food over there to his bros. When he gets there, he hears this big mouth giant say something. And David just goes, what, what did he say? Now this is a teenager. This is not somebody that's been in ministry for 20 years that knows the, everything and is a guru and knows the Bible back when that's not, that's not this, this is a kid. And he walks up and says, what did he just say? And that day, he defeated him. He did it. Now, you have to understand, Saul wasn't going to do it. His brothers wasn't going to do it. This has happened 40 days and 40 nights. 40, day, 40 days, consecutive days in the morning and at night, Goliath was running his big mouth. And a teenager doing a normal job walks up and says, what did he say? This is important for us to understand. Never underestimate how the simple, everyday, natural acts of our lives influence supernatural outcomes. What you do on a regular basis, reading your Bible is a natural thing. Do it. Just consistently do it. I don't care if it's five minutes. Do it something habitually. Just start doing it. Get up and go to work. You say, I don't have a job. Get up and act like you have one. No, I'm serious. Get up and act like you have one. Get up on time and go to your office and act like you have a job. Well, I don't have one. Listen, make phone calls like you have one. Act like it. Listen, you'd be surprised how in the Bible how natural things led to supernatural events. It wasn't the other way around. The supernatural did not happen first, and then the natural event happened second. The natural thing happened first, then the supernatural thing happened. That's when you want a redemptive plan for your life. I'm just telling you, do the natural things well. Redemption will begin to come. It just starts showing up. I can't explain it. I don't know why. Get up, get dressed. Comb your hair. If you have any. Sorry about that, buddy. Redemption's a journey, and when you see it, you start watching the hand of God play out in your life. I've seen it happen, I can't tell you how many times, for me. When I told Pastor George that when I was hired, I came here in 2003, we actually went back to Kentucky for two years after we graduated Bible school and came back, and I started in 03. It's been 20 years. I told him I'd give him five. But how many of you know you don't get to plan that out? The redemptive plan of God gets to be played out, and if you follow it, Redemption will come. It will come. Why? Because I'm going to put my hands in the, I'm going to put my life in the Redeemer's hand. Now, you may have messed your life up and you say, man, I don't know how this is possible. Let me just tell you this. Get your life in the hand of the Redeemer as fast as you can, no matter how much you've messed it up. Get your hand out of your hand. Get your life out of your hands where you got it all figured out. And I know what I'm going to do here, and I'm going to know you don't. Listen, I never thought I'd be a youth pastor when you're 57. It shouldn't happen. <laughs> I had a guy tell me about three years ago, hey, I think you're the oldest youth pastor in America. That's what he told me. <laughs> he was from, from a, he's just a friend of mine in Birmingham. And I said, dude, you, you shouldn't be saying that. And he said, actually, I think you might be the oldest youth pastor in the world. <laughs> God's redemption. That's all we know. Here's the second thing. Redemption almost always is a process. It never just happens. It's not microwaved. It's not microwaved. God can do a miracle in a moment, but most of what he does is through a process I participate in. This happened with Ruth. It happened all through scripture where people participated in the plan. God did not just sovereignly do something. Now, he may have sovereignly chose someone, but the plan had to be participated in by the person. 
Happened all through scripture. As soon as you and I get involved in the process, the better off your life's gonna be no matter how much it hurts. Anybody ever gone through a painful process where, I mean, you just didn't like going through it? Anybody ever had to forgive someone you did not want to forgive? I mean, I'm gonna hold this thing until they pay. How many of you know that's completely, totally unbiblical? They are never going to be able to pay. But the problem is this. You can't pay. What if God held yours? God will put you in a process like that, and he'll put you in something to get you. To, he will cook you in an oven. Because God is either preparing me for something or he's preparing something for me in the process. He's doing one or the other. He's preparing you for something or he's preparing something for you. And I'm telling you what, when he starts preparing you and me for something, it gets painful. When you have to go back and make restitution for certain things or go apologize for something or get your attitude straight because you know you're wrong or maybe even you're not wrong and somebody else was wrong, but it's killing you on the inside and you won't let it go. I've had to deal with that. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to give you just, um, I'm going to try to explain this the best I can because this could really help some people here. It helped me when I figured this out. The way you know if a particular area of your life has gone through a redemptive process and is whole, how do you know if you're, if you've gone through something and I'm whole? Here's how you know. If someone can touch the scar that it created and it causes you no pain. When the wound that you have can be touched and you're not triggered, you're whole. A divorce happened. Something happened. Somebody passed away. You don't understand how this could happen. Why God? Why kid? Why husband? Why church? You know how many young adults that I deal with that has church hurt? I mean, it is profound how many of them are hurt. Some of it is churches on making, some of it's their own making. We don't give, we don't give free passes just because you, you had hurt. But listen, you can have hurt and be whole. Let me explain it this way, maybe. Everybody knows Doubting Thomas in the Bible. I don't know why we call him Doubting Thomas. The Bible doesn't refer to him as Doubting Thomas. It just calls him Thomas. But I promise you, if you were there and you were, you, if I were in the Bible, I would be doubting Greg. It wouldn't be any different. Everybody, how many of you ever had the conversation with, listen, when I get to heaven, and when I see Adam, we're going to have a conversation. Anybody ever had that conversation? Anybody ever thought like that? Hey, listen, he and I are going to find out why. No, you don't need to do that. Because if it, had been Gre- if, if it had been Greg and Eve, it would have been exactly the same result. And so we get on down on th- uh, Doubting Thomas or Thomas in the Bible. And in Luke's, in, in, in John's Gospel, chapter 20, it tells the story about the disciples telling him that Jesus had, been, had risen from the dead. And he says this, listen, if I don't see the nail prints in his hand, and if I can't touch the scar, his side, and the wound in his side, I will not believe. The Bible says a week went by. And they're all together again somewhere in some room, and Jesus just walks right through the door. Doesn't knock. Just, he has a glorified body, so he just walks through the wall, just walks right in. And he goes straight up to Thomas. Isn't that amazing? That God, there's a guy in the Bible that is full of doubt, has blatantly said something, and Jesus chases him down. Do you know how many people run from God because they think they're, God's mad at them because they doubt something? They do it all the time, and the problem is, is Jesus is trying to chase you down. Walks right in the room where he is, and he walks right over to Thomas and said, hey, touch. Here you go. Here you go. You can touch. Go ahead. Why? You need to understand, Jesus has a glorified body. He still has scars. Even in his glorified state right now, Jesus has the scars. That he, that he was whipped with on a cross. Here's why 
Here's what I think. God told him, he said, you can touch this because Jesus was whole. He went through all the beating, all the stripes on his back, all the crown on thorns on his head, all the nails in his wrist or his hand, wherever they put it, and a puncture in the side. I mean, you know, if, if somebody had touched him while he was on the cross, he would have had a lot more pain. Why? Because it's a wound. But because Jesus was glorified and he was resurrected and he had gone through the process of being whole and healed, he had no problem with somebody touching his scars. Because here's how you know you're healed. Somebody can touch your wound and touch your scar and you don't get triggered. You know why you have scars? So you can have a testimony and show here's what God did. It wasn't what, listen, it's not what the people did to you. I have a scar right here. Most of you can't see it. It's right here. When my little boy, Ethan, was uh, about two years old, we had a lamp right by our couch, and he was playing over there, and it was one of those tall lamp stands, and it had one of those elbow arms, you know, one of these things that go out like this, and he was playing over there, and I was goofing off on the floor. He hit the, he hit the lamp, and the lamp started turning over, and the lampshade come off of it, and it was going right toward him, and I reached over, and I, some weird way, I got off balance, and I grabbed the thing, when I did, the, the, the swivel on the lamp landed and the bulb landed right on my arm. Pain. But you know why I did it? For my son. It was pain. I, you know why I can tell you the story today? Because it's just a scar. I have a scar, but there's no pain. I can touch it. I, can do it. I have one right here. I got hit in the head on my, my wedding day. <laughs> not by Polly I'm just, I'm just so you know I had to work we were so broke I had to work the day we got married and for some reason I went down to hit something with a hammer and something hit me right in the head and I still have a scar right here I walk into <laughs> I'm getting dressed and putting a tux on and they walk in upon it and said hey everything's okay Greg just has a huge gash right in his forehead <laughs> they doctored it all up well it's all funny now but that day it wasn't funny because it, it was a wound. That's how you know the, listen, it's how you know redemption has happened. It's where you can have a scar, something's happened to you, God has come in and healed it, and you can use it as a testimony of what God's done in your life. God's preparing you for something. It's always going on. Now listen, God is far more concerned about who I'm becoming than what I'm producing. Now, in the American culture and in the business world and in the church world, everything has to always be up and to the right. And if it's not, it's a problem. With God, he will slow you down and let you have peaks and valleys in your life so you can become what he wants you to become. Because a lot of us, if you're not careful, including myself, you start chasing numbers, you you start chasing success, and you will become something God never intended you to become. Now, he doesn't have a problem with you being successful. He doesn't have a problem with us reaching our goals. But how many of you know we need to become like him in the process? And God will completely do that. Listen, a process always requires next steps. If you're going to have any kind of redemptive plan in your life, you're going to have to take next steps. Ruth had to take next steps. It was a very challenging time, but she had to make some decisions along the way of what she was going to do. And here's three things real quick that you gotta do, ask this question. What's the wisest next step that I can take? When you're in a crisis situation, you're in a redemptive process and something's going on in your life and you need God to redeem something in your life, you need to be asking this question. What's the wisest next step you can take? And here's why. Because most of the time when we get in a crisis, we want to speed things up because we wanna get back to comfort as fast as we can. And God is not always concerned about your comfort. I am. When I was in Disney World, I found the closest, the, every ride that had air conditioning in it, I rode it over and over again. I take naps in rides. <laughs> Living with the land is a great spot to just go out. And I just tell them, can I ride again? Just keep it going. <laughs> I do. That's a wise step for me to take. But listen, you'd be surprised when things get hot how much you want to be comforted. 
And if you're not careful, you'll make really unwise decisions because of comfort. And God wants you to slow down and what's the wisest next step you can take in the process that you're in right now. Here's the second way. What's the most peaceful next step I can take? We need to follow peace. I have made more decisions following God by knowing that I had peace in my heart about doing it than any other thing that I've ever done. Now listen to me. Many of you, and I've done it too, we want to hear the voice of God. Oh, God, I need to hear your voice. And listen, I'm going to just, you need to understand this is so helpful that when you do not hear the voice of God, what you want is the wisdom and the peace of God. Because wisdom, the wisdom of God and the peace of God are the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's not an audible voice. As a matter of fact, if you start asking God to give you audible voices, let's just, number one, you're going to be weird before long. And number two, every time someone got an audible voice from God in, in the Bible, there was conflict right after it. I learned real quick, don't ask for that. I don't want any of that. You gotta ask, what's the most peaceful next step you can take? Because life gets real chaotic when you're in a, when you're in a situation like Naomi and Ruth were, where you've lost your wife or your husband and your two sons and your husbands. How many of you know it can get really chaotic really fast? Here's the last one. What's the most God-honoring next step that I can take? We want to honor God. How many of you ever been in a situation where you had to make a really tough decision and you were going to have to violate Scripture to, to get what you wanted? How many of you know you can't violate the Bible to get what you want? Yeah. You, got to do, you got to make God-honoring next steps. Even if it costs you something now, even if you have to swear to your own hurt, you do God-honoring things. Here's why. Because when you, do why, when you make wise decisions... You make peaceful decisions and you make God-honoring decisions. You stay in the redemptive process that God has put you in. When you get out of it, the redemption process stops until you get back in. Here's the last thing. Redemption is personal. It's very personal. Let me explain it to you like this. In the beginning of Scripture and creation, the first place that the redemptive plan of God shows up First of all, it was in heaven. We know that before the foundation of the world, God had this plan laid out. He knew what was going to happen, and he just says, I'm going to prepare for this beforehand. Adam and Eve come along, and they're in the garden, and we know this story. Most of us would know it, and they blow the whole thing. Sin enters into the world, and they are the ones that hide. God did not hide from them. They hid from God. This is important because when you're in a redemptive process, if you're not careful, the enemy will tell you to run away from God. And God's chasing you down to get redemption to you. It's a lie of the enemy for you to hide from God. They clothe themselves. God approaches them and starts talking to them about this. And somewhere in the Bible, I mean, some, something happened here because the Bible says that he clothed them with some kind of animal skin. I don't know what it was. But somewhere in the garden, God personally goes and slays an innocent animal sheds blood and covers these two people with a sacrifice. That's the first time redemption ever hit planet Earth. Then we go to Abraham and Isaac's going, you know, he has his son Isaac and the, God tells him to take him up on the mountain and I want you to slay him as a sacrifice. Isaac's walking up with his dad and they're going up and Isaac's got the wood on his back. Well, why wouldn't he have wood on his back? Who else had wood on their back? Jesus took a tree and carried it on his back up a hill. That's why Isaac did what he did. He gets up there, this is a kid. He says, hey, Dad, we got the wood and we got this, and where is the sacrifice? And his dad, you know what his dad said to him? The Lord will provide a sacrifice. So he lays him up on the altar, starts everything, raises the knife to slay him. The Lord stops his hand and he sees a ram in the thicket over here. God provided a redeemer. It got real personal with Abraham. Moses comes along. He's got to deliver all the children of Israel out of Egypt. After the, tenth, after the ninth plague, there's going to be a death angel come over and he tells everybody, listen, I need you to slaughter a lamb. Every house 
you need to get a lamb. It needs to be male, it needs to be young, and it needs to be spotless. I need you to kill it, and I need you to take it, and I need you to sh- put the blood on the door lintels of your house. I need you to roast the thing, and I need you to eat it. Sounds like communion. The death angel comes, slaughters every firstborn of every family that didn't have that process done. It got real personal. And Jeremiah comes along. Well, nothing happened to Jeremiah. Well, actually, it did. I looked through Scripture, and I found this little issue called the Jericho. And Joshua sent spies out to spy out the, the city of Jericho before they destroyed it. And they found a little girl, this girl. Evidently, her house where she lived was on the outside of the wall. And so they went in and she hid them from all of the guys in Jericho, hid them. And when they got ready to leave, they said, hey, we're coming and we're going to destroy this whole city. But here's what I want you to do. If you'll just take this scarlet thread and throw it out your window, hold it out of your window, and then get all of your family inside of this, your house. When we come, we'll see that scarlet thread and we won't touch your house. You know what happened? God spared that girl's life. Do you know what that girl's name is? Her name is Rahab. She was a harlot. She had a past. She'd messed her life up. God didn't care. He redeemed her anyway. Do you know who Rahab gave birth to? His name is Boaz. The dude we've been talking about all morning. The redeemer of Ruth. God used a harlot. She's even mentioned in the whole redemptive thread of mankind. It's amazing. We get to Ruth, and here's we have. Ruth is in Moab, doesn't even know God, has no right to even have a relationship with God, but she hooks her wagon to Naomi. Naomi doesn't, she knows who Boaz is, maybe, but Ruth has no idea who he is. So she gets close to Naomi and they get back to Bethlehem and she gets close to the Redeemer. Close enough that I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get in his field and I'm just gonna glean some grain from his field. It gets really personal. And the next thing you hear about Ruth is Naomi told her, said, hey, he's, he's in the threshing floor and at night and I need you to just go lay down at his feet. She gets really close to the Redeemer. The next thing we hear is what we read today. Boaz is redeeming this woman in a public setting in front of everybody. I'll buy her. Here's the crazy part. The dude that was supposed to redeem her didn't. Boaz chose to do it. Just like God has chosen to do it to you. It got so personal, she married the dude. Not only did he get that personal, she had a kid by that guy. Boaz is the, is the dad of Obed. And Obed gave birth to Jesse, so Boaz is the grandfather of Jesse. Jesse is the father of King David. So Boaz is the great grandfather of King David, who is the in the, I mean, big time lineage. You read all the scripture, bro. David is critical to the Bible. And here's the crazy part. It goes through on a, I'm gonna close. I'm going through all of this. It's going through all of this. It gets to that thread gets to Jesus. He dies on the cross for you and me. And when it happened, 
It no longer just was a thread that went through Scripture. It exploded and started going to individuals all over the place. Whoever had faith, and he would hook redemption to those people and pull them in. It's called the church, and you are in it. And just so you know, you're close to the Redeemer. He's so close. And today, if you're far away from God, he's here to say, come on. Not in Moab anymore. Yeah, I know you messed your life up. I know somebody passed away. I know you lost something. Come on, get close. I need you to get close. You can even, hey, you can get around some of the field. And you can pick some of the grain, but I need you to get closer than that. You can, you can lay down at my feet if you want to, and you can get that close. Or... I'll just redeem you. I'll marry you and redeem you. That's how close he is. Some of you, you need to make that move today. You've never gotten close to the Redeemer. You said, I don't even like this religious thing. Me either. But I do love a Redeemer. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, speak to your people. Speak to the people that are far, far away from you. Speak. If you're here today, you say, Pastor Greg, would you pray for me? I'm far from God. I need the Redeemer. I need Christ. I need him in my life. Maybe you're here and you've been a Christian for a long time. You've blown it. You've gone to Moab. And I mean, you messed your whole life. has fallen apart. You just need to get close. You need to get close. You need to get close. God loves you. If you're here today and you want prayer, I want you to be bold and I want you to be fast. Obey what's in your heart. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you forward or anything like that. But if you want prayer today, I want you to lift your hand right now and say, hey, that's me. Pray for me, Pastor Greg. I need prayer. Over here. Thank you. Anybody else over here? Thank you, guys, over here to my left. Thank you. Be bold. Be quick as you possibly can. So you just follow your heart. Thank you, sweetheart. Anybody else up here at the top? Thank you very much. Be bold. Be both over here to my left. Thank you. Thank you over here to my corner. Thank you. I love you. In the middle here. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to pray a prayer. We all believe in what they're doing. We've done this before, and we're a big family here. We've all been redeemed, or there's going to be people that's going to be redeemed this morning. And we're going to say a big, huge prayer together. And, and if you would, I want everybody to join this. If you lifted your hand, I want you to say this in your heart today. I want you to say it out loud. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross to redeem me. Today, I get close to you. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. Save my soul. Forgive me. Be my redeemer today. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Give it up for these people. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Love you. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, as soon as we're done, we're going to have a whole group of people up here that are friends of ours, and we want to pray with you. We have a Bible for you. We have, if you need prayer for anything, maybe something's going on in your life and you need prayer, we want you to pray. We want to pray for you and get close and, and just help walk you through this journey. We're going to say a blessing, so let's all stand to our feet. We say this every week, and we want to declare it over our family, our church family, and ourselves. So let's say this together. Say it with me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Have a great day.